Hey there, listeners. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Audible.com is offering Beyond the Uniform listeners one free audiobook. You can see this offer, as well as a list of every book guests have recommended on the show, at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. That's beyondtheuniform.io slash books. Thanks and enjoy the show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today's episode number 69 with Alex Martin. At this point, I really don't think I could have, you know, a boundary. You know, it's not it's not about 40 hour work week and being able to accomplish everything in 40 hours. I get that. It's about constantly thinking about the product, thinking about the, the customers we have, the customers we want, where we're going to go, what the next steps are. And I just can't turn it off. And, you know, I dream about it. I think about it every uh, minute. Um, and there is no separation. And maybe that's unhealthy and a bad thing. But I really, at this point, it's kind of, if no one's, you know, fanatically um, excited and obsessed with the, the product and what you're trying to do than the people who are the founders, then it, I don't think it can work at this stage. The top three reasons to listen to today's episode are, number one, service. Alex has continued to serve in the Marine Corps Reserves. He worked in Kenya with the organization Nuru, helping local farmers grow their income, and his own company, AC Global Risk, has a service element as well. He's a great role model for keeping service as an active component of your life and talks about how to serve as a for-profit venture. Number two, startups. Alex started his first company straight out of the Marine Corps, and it failed. He learned from it, and he's now 18 months into his second company, AC Global Risk. He is very honest and balanced in his interview about failure, about mistakes, and how these are essential for entrepreneurs. Number three, Stanford Ignite. Alex goes in depth on the Stanford Ignite program, as well as many other really valuable resources for those of you interested in startups. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you can find these great resources. In the show notes, I've got the links to all the books Alex mentions, the podcasts we talk about, as well as the other interviews that come up in our discussion. And with that, let's dive in to my interview with Alex Martin. Well, joining me today, normally in San Francisco, but today actually in Ecuador, is Alex Martin. Alex, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, Justin. How are you? Good, good. Um, I wanted to give listeners a quick background on you. Um, Alex is the CEO and co-founder of AC Global Risk, a company that creates solutions to transform how companies and governments vet, screen, and access internal and external human-based risk. Alex started out at the Naval Academy and served in the Marine Corps for seven years as an infantry and ground reconnaissance officer. After his transition from the Marines, he founded Sky Maritime, which was Maritime Security Services to Commercial Shipping Company, as well um, as well as he worked on the Kenya team uh, as the Kenya team leader for the nonprofit Nuru International. Alex is currently a major in the Marine Corps Reserves. Um, so, Alex, just to start off, I always like to learn about um, when you made that decision to transition from active duty of the Marine Corps and how you approached that decision. Yeah, sure. So I think it came around the time I had done four deployments and it, there was a decision in, in every career officer's mode when, you know, you kind of have to leave the platoon um, and go uh, and kind of grow um, as a generalist in, in the Marine Corps. And I think at the time I was I was probably a little um, a little tired um, from the, the back to back deployments um, and also not probably too excited about kind of going into into more of a, a stateside based role. And I think that's what kind of started the thinking around, you know, transitioning from active duty um, into the civilian sector. And what was your experience like being part of the reserves? And I'm, I'm particularly cur- curious if that's had any adverse impact on your career and what you've done. Yeah, sure. You know, when I when I first left, it was kind of a, a more of a business decision of, hey, I, I knew I was probably going to do something in the entrepreneur space. Um, and the reserves just offer such a great, you know, value proposition when they say, hey, we can give you health care. Um, you have a chance to make some extra uh, money. Um, there was also this kind of underlying uh, thought of, well, maybe I, I'll want to go back. And I didn't want to close the door because I, I was worried I would uh, miss it and might want a pathway back in. And I got some great advice to kind of keep that going. Um, so that that's kind of why I stayed in at first. And I'd say over the years, it's been more of kind of on the emotional side of things, being around Marines and sailors and loving that. Difficulty wise, um, I think, you know, time is our most precious resource. And so spending time doing anything other than 
you know, the startup or your family obviously detracts from either of those. So, um, but I've, you know, I see it as, as a kind of a value add to, um, you know, being a better, uh, husband and one day father citizen. Um, so maybe it's taken some time away from, from the company, but, um, not, not too great an impact. That's great. I mean, I love that um, it's come up before on the show how much of someone's identity changes when they leave the military. And so it scratches, it seems like it scratches that itch for you of continuing to serve, continuing to have connection, um, continuing to have that be part of your life. But the entrepreneurial component is really interesting because it does seem like it would provide you a little bit more uh, buoyancy as you go into the, the charted, uncharted depths of entrepreneurship and giving you that health care and a little bit more security. Um, so that's that's a great pros and cons uh, layout that you gave us. Yeah. What about uh, the Stanford Ignite program? I was curious what brought you to Stanford Ignite and how that influenced your path with entrepreneurship. And, and maybe starting, it sounds like you knew you wanted to pursue entrepreneurship before Stanford Ignite. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, our first company, um, you know, I started the day I left active duty, that maritime security company. Um, we had an idea. We raised some capital. We launched overseas. And I think we went to market the same day that Somali pirates decided they um, didn't want to uh, didn't want to attack ships anymore. And um, I learned a lot from that, what I call my first nonprofit experience um, at, at, uh, at Sky Maritime. But but that kind of, you know, the segue into working for Nuru, which was an incredible experience. Um, and, you know, I still am very closely associated with them and always will be in their mission, which I uh, truly believe in. And it was there that I got the introduction to Stanford um, and the program, the Ignite program. Um, my boss was a, uh, at Nuru was a Stanford grad, Jay Karaman, um, tremendous uh, leader. He heard about this new program that was working so well at Stanford and they're opening it up for post 9-11 vets. And, you know, Jake said, I think you could uh, stand to learn some more um, things about business. So how about we send send you and you can come back and help integrate some of the lessons learned into the business function um, at Nuru in Nuru, Kenya. And so I did. And that's, that's, that was kind of the introduction, um, you know, w- and it was uh, completely, um, you know, it was a completely, you know, change of mindset, um, change of opportunity, change of landscape. And it provided just a wonderful experience, both, both academically, um, but also kind of on, on a, I'd say an emotional side of being kind of, um, given the confidence that, hey, this Silicon Valley, this Palo Alto, um, there's room for, for vets in here and there's, there's a need. Um, and Stanford kind of enabled, uh, kind of equipped us with some of those tools that we, we needed to understand that, uh, that, that world. So really phenomenal experience there. And I'll, I'll be having the folks from Stanford, uh, Stanford Ignite on the, the show pretty soon. But um, what was the, could you just give the brief overview of how long the program lasted, what the days were like, and just some of the things that you learned or kind of studied in that program? Yeah, sure. So it's, it's four weeks. Um, it's Monday through Friday, pretty long days. Um, you know, you start first thing in the morning and um, you know, you, you're in these uh, classes, um, and they're, they're basically kind of taking the best of, of Stanford's, uh, uh, faculty and curriculum around, um, you know, early stage ventures around uh, entrepreneurship and, and they're, they're giving it to you in these, in these doses, um, that are, that are consumable, but also, um, highly interactive. Um, you go through the, through the design thinking process. Um, you do, uh, you know, field trips to various companies in the air, in the area, you have talks with other vets who have transitioned into tech and other industries. Um, and they, they kind of nicely tie everything together and they kind of demystify a lot of the things surrounding entrepreneurship, but also some of the hard business skills, um, that you kind of think you are going to, um, loathe like finance and they make it really, really interesting. Um, and they just expose you to marketing, to, you know, to sales, to how to, uh, can do a pitch deck and throughout the program, you're organized around a small team that has a venture so that the class is divided into teams and you're working on your project as you're progressing through the curriculum. And then after class, you're meeting with your team and you're working on your pitch deck. And the idea is that it culminates in this one time uh, pitch in front of live venture capitalists, which was super um, and thrilling, right? Because there you are, you're sitting across from these um, guys and gals that do this um, for a living, um, incredibly smart and talented people. And you're there with your team doing your pitch. And so 
it's just a really fun experience. Um, it opens up your eyes, like I said, demystifies the process, but also equips you with a, an understanding of, of how you can kind of approach, um, you know, being a being an entrepreneur. Um, it also, I would I would add, it also introduces you to the the network of Stanford. So, you know, not being smart enough or talented enough to get into the two year program, this was a way for a guy like me to be able to um, be in the same room with really smart people that actually went to uh, to Stanford and got the degree. So um, be having access to that network and then the larger Ignite Network, which is a worldwide organization, is phenomenal. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I benefit by it every, every day in some way or another. That's, that's exceptional. And I really appreciate that overview. And um, I was excited to see in your background that you had worked at Nero. So I was a year behind Jake Harriman at the GSB, and I was there at the end of his second year, the end of my first year. He, uh, you know, we gathered in this house, and he gave, I believe it was the first pitch of Nero and what he was doing, and such an incredible story behind why he started that nonprofit. And I'm having on the show in a couple of weeks here. But um, I wanted to learn about your experience. But but first, if you could explain to listeners what Neuro is, what they do, and then sort of what your experience with them was like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd agree that uh, Jake's uh, pitch is pretty phenomenal, and and it comes from the heart, which is what any um, I think investor or partner looks like in a in a in a venture, which is authenticity and and need right market size, need authenticity, and then ability to deliver and. Jake and Nuru have that in spades. So Nuru is a is a social venture. Um, it's des- it's meant to help uh, um, the poor living in you know kind of rural remote regions. And the mission is to end extreme poverty, specifically for um, you know the far- the small shareholder farmers. Um, they have an integrated model, which is very unique um, and exciting. Um, it includes uh, agriculture and healthcare, um, as well as financial inclusion. There's also a for-profit component to it. And the idea is that it will become uh, self-sustaining and independent of philanthropy. So it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty robust um, uh, program. It's a bit staffed with some really phenomenal talent and the traction that it's been having, you know, with the first pilot project in Kenya and now in Ethiopia um, with some other great plans on the horizon as well. It's pretty exciting. So, um, and Nuru, you know, Nuru means the light in Swahili. So it's a pretty um, inspiring message. But the thing for me having, you know, no background in international development, right? If I heard international development, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, I would have thought that meant doing real estate um, over in Europe or something. So, you know, it was an eye-opening thing for me to be around, you know, around the need to, it's kind of, it was, it was, I definitely um, had experiences when I was working offshore Somalia and some of these other um, places where I worked in the, in the military that said, Hey, this is, a, this is a mission I can get behind. Um, I think there's got to be another way we can approach the problem at, at its core. Um, and Nuru's trying to do just that by using this holistic model um, to go in and basically enable local leaders to, you know, build out the solution themselves with access to, uh, give them access to capital, you know, um, some training around better agronomic practices um, and basically just, you know, doing what, you know, for instance, a Stanford Ignite does for an entrepreneur basically says you're a phenomenal, highly talented, um, you know, Farmer and farmers are the bravest entrepreneurs. Um, I saw that firsthand for two years um, living living in uh, in rural Kenya, and it, and it basically says, look, like here's your tools and and you know use your this design process and create the solution that's right in your context. Um, and oh by the way, we're going to exit. So the expats are going to exit after certain key things uh, metrics have been met, so that you can continue to scale, um, grow uh, Nuru, um, you know, kind of for you, by you. Um, and that's another element to Nuru that makes it different is it not only will eventually become independent of philanthropy, not only does it, oh, by the way, have actual impact that's measured against core matrices um, and measure, with measured data, but oh, by the way, it's going to be you know controlled locally led, which is really fundamental, I think, to sustainability. So really exciting. You know, my first uh, um, day on the job out there um, you know, it was just the end of a, of a, of a pretty long, in the middle of a long hunger season, pretty hard to see that, you know, kind of firsthand. Um, and then working in that context surrounded by, um, you know, the realities of extreme poverty. And, you know, what I did is I came away with, you know, one a total, um, reverence and respect for small shareholder farmers. Um, and the, just the bravery that they have as entrepreneurs and, and, um, 
and that was kind of like the core of the, of the model. But, you know, for me, it was a, it also helped with the transition of going from, you know, being kind of military, early, early entrepreneur. And what it really did is it, it just rattled me to the reality that I think, um, you know, that my personal calling was more on the, on the social venture side and, or, you know, for profit, for purpose. And I think the venture we're doing now that very much is for profit, for purpose, and I'll, I'll speak to that maybe later in the program, but basically there should be a double bottom line in, in, in there can be in all that we do. And, you know, new really awakened me to that necessity. Is that, I mean, I, I was, I wanted to learn about the genesis of AC global risk and, you know, tell us about when you first had, what do you view as kind of like the birth of that idea in your mind? Maybe it came about years later, but when did that idea first come to you? Yeah. So first, it, w- it wasn't my idea. Um, I was just uh, I'm kind of the beneficiary of um, a couple people's life work, really. Um, and so well before um, I had, uh, you know, even perceived the notion of, of being a part of an organization um, that uses a technology to, you know, help accelerate the speed of trust. It was it was this kind of life work of, of a few people to um, design and create and build, um, build this technology, which the build business is built around. Um, I met, um, those individuals later in my experience, actually, while I was at working at Nuru through some of my partners in our first venture. And we had a lot of lessons learned from the first venture one, you know, having a background in the military and special operations that we had, it was kind of, you know, some great things that were a part of that shared, um, background and shared history and things that are advantageous, I, I believe, in, in the business world, especially in the entrepreneur context. But we were lacking um, a discernible differentiator, you know, or moat that we could protect like a technology. Um, and that's something that, that we were looking for. Um, and then when we came across uh, the people that had been working for almost a decade to, to build this technology out, to get it tested, um, to, you know, to kind of bring it to their test market, it was kind of the perfect coming together and basically we approached them and said, Hey, can we bring this idea to the Stanford program to just use it as our, as our model, right? As our kind of venture and think about how we would maybe scale this and, you know, take all the great work that had been done with this pretty incredible technology and bring it to market. And so it was kind of while I was at Nuru, while I was at Stanford and then this opportunity came about, um, and that was the genesis from it. And I think everyone came together and said, look, we have a pretty, we have a really unique product. Um, it's going to take a lot of really smart engineers and a lot of really smart, you know, um, guys who can think about operational art and you know scaling and marketing to at least get this started. And um, you know that that's how it started. And and how would you explain AC Global Risk if you were um, talking to another veteran? How would you explain what your company does? Yeah. So we we are um, you know what we're our end game is to be able to help screen and vet individuals in places where, um, you know, the need is there. So we talk about trust gap resolution. You know, we, there's a lot of talk in this age of being in this kind of post-truth era. And we're trying to, we're trying to rescue some of that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, of applications and a lot of, you know, um, basically markets that, that we will be attacking. But the core um, of the business is that we provide technical risk assessments um, by looking at subtle but specific frequencies of the human voice that are constant across um, languages and culture. And we're able to evaluate those responses in an automated interview for risk factors. Now, we're not lie detection. Lie detection is binary. It requires an admission or confession. You know, polygraph and other, other systems are designed to identify whether or not a person is lying or, or not. We don't do that. We're simply conducting a large level screening for the people that are worried about where risk lies. And so we're kind of mapping this human terrain and saying, look, over here is low risk, here's some possible risk, and here is where you should allocate your resources. And fundamentally, when we talk about trust gap resolution, we're talking about providing data to allow decision makers to narrowly focus their efforts, resources, and other tools to either block that risk, transfer that risk, absorb that risk, or other ways mitigate that risk. So we're simply a first order tool, and we do it by means of evaluating the human voice. And what does your day-to-day life look like as the CEO? I mean, it sounds like currently involves quite a bit of travel, but what's what's kind of like your day-to-day and week-to-week life look like? 
Yeah, you know, it's it's crazy and in a great way. Um, you know, always I daily stop myself and and just kind of give thanks for you know the opportunity that we're that we're here and we're growing and we've got great traction. I get to work with people that I love um, with with a product that um, I'm wildly excited about and. And so it's it's cool. So the day to day is 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 chaotic though because we're all wearing a bunch of hats and um, you know we're in this stage where we're, we're building up and we're hitting the market and we're getting this great traction. But we're also, you know, it's a very flat organization. You know, I think a lot of people's misconception of military people is that we're hierarchical and we're slow to move and we need all these processes. And you know, I maybe some are. Um, but at least in the Marine Corps, um, in the units I worked with, we, we were flat, um, we were creative, we had to wear a lot of different hats. And, you know, you rely on each other to basically, you know, solve problems. And I think that it's just a daily exercise in problem solving. And I'm never the guy with the answer. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, curating the smarter people in the room and, you know, helping to to kind of drive these 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 uh, these 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 problem solving uh, Basically, it's a, basically it's a rolling cycle of problem solving and a rolling cycle of anxiety. And the anxiety is a great thing because it's, hey, is this going to work? Yes, it is. Hey, are we going to get are the customers? Yes. Are they going to love it? Yes. But how do we scale? And as long as the anxiety is rolling in the right direction, it's a really uh, healthy and exciting anxiety. And so far, so good. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's the day to day <laughs> chaos, but exciting. What is what's the lifestyle component? I mean, it, I think it's always helpful for people to understand I mean, do you feel like you have any room for a life right now or is there, is there balance or are weekends okay or, or what, how much time do you get away from actually, um, your, your, your job? Yeah, that's a great question. I have, um, I don't really, I, you know, it's kind of, um, it's a kind of an obsession right now. Um, there really is not a, a healthy balance. Um, but right now the balance is like, Hey, this is, you know, there's an imperative to accomplish these things and I enjoy it too. So, you know, you have to carve out certain things like you have to get six to eight hours of sleep. And sometimes that's hard. You have to work out every day um, because that's important for your mental health as well as your physical health. But aside from that, then you have to spend time, a little bit of time with your family. Um, I'm engaged. She, my fiance is also an entrepreneur, so she gets it. Um, and so we have a really nice understanding of, you know, there really is no boundary, um, and at this point, I really don't think I could have, um, you know, a boundary, you know, it's not, it's not about 40 hour work week and being able to accomplish everything in 40 hours. I get that. It's about constantly thinking about the product, thinking about the, the customers we have, the customers we want, where we're going to go, what the next steps are. And I just can't turn it off. And, you know, I dream about it. I think about it every uh, minute. Um, and there is no, um, separation and maybe that's unhealthy and a bad thing, but I really, at this point, it's kind of, if no one's, you know, fanatically, um, excited and obsessed with the, the product and what you're trying to do, then the people who are the founders, then it, I don't think it can work at this stage. Maybe, you know, um, two or three years from now, um, I get fired as CAO, CEO, they bring on some uh, really smart guy that can continue to scale this thing. Then I can maybe, um, you know have a weekend and, and take a trip and stuff like that. But until now, this is kind of, um, this is kind of the obsession. It's so funny you say that. I mean, li literally just about an hour ago, I, I was driving somewhere and was listening to the podcast EO fire entrepreneur on fire, which I, I, I interviewed their founder here in a couple of weeks, but, um, he interviewed this guy, Grant Cardone, and I'll put a, a link in the show notes for listeners, but the, the title was Be Obsessed or Be Average. And, and, and <laughs> like this, that. yeah, this guy's whole premise was that for some reason, society has gotten to, to, to um, associate obsession with a negative thing. And just talking about how positive obsession is when you're obsessed with something good, like it sounds like you are with, with AC Global Risk, you're obsessed with it and you're enjoying it. It's not this compulsive, negatively addictive behavior. It is something that it sounds like is, is empowering you to live a very passionate life and to have a very big impact on others in the work that you're doing. So I think it's great to hear that. And, you know, I think that everyone has to figure out their own work life balance. But um, when you're doing something you love, I think that that you know, that brings more energy and that brings more passion, that brings more fulfillment to your life than it takes away. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I think that's right. 
Um, if you don't mind me asking, one one thing I'm always curious about too with entrepreneurs is um, how long it took you to be able to pay yourself a salary. And the reason I ask is it particularly for um, maybe if someone's on active duty and they're thinking of how much they need to build up their savings or if someone's at a job right now as a veteran and they're thinking of starting their own thing, setting the context of, of how much runway they need, how much room they need to be able to, to, to survive before they can look to their, their um, you know, startup to start uh, sustaining them. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm sure it varies on where, on what stage, you know, everyone would be at. But for me, it was, um, and for me, it was about a year. Um, and, you know, during that time, there was a mixture of, uh, you know, using savings, um, burning a lot of credit cards, um, and, you know, just kind of going all in um, with that, working some night jobs and weekend jobs. You know, you, you can't be afraid to, you know, be a bartender, drive an Uber, um, be someone's you know, uh, personal assistant, whatever it takes, there's, 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 you know, 24 hours in the day. Um, and, and you can, you can make, you know, the minimum amount of income that you need and still have a full, a full work day or more and the weekends to, to focus on your venture. And, and that's what I did. And that's what, um, you know, when we were bootstrapping this thing and the, you know, the creators of this technology did it for, you know, years, um, uh, before that. And so it was, you know, labor of love for them. Um, and we just kind of luck, we're lucky enough to come on the back end and only have to, you know, close the last gap, uh, you know, a year or so. Um, but, but there certainly is that. Um, and of course the reserves help too, right? Just a little bit of additional, um, income from them. So you kind of cobble together, um, you know, a little bit of income and then you just, um, you know, you go all in with your, with your, if you believe in it, you go all in with everything and, um, get the family on board. And, you know, the worst thing that happens um, is that you fail, you learn a lot and you're broke and that ain't so bad. You know what I mean? Especially I think coming off, off of, um, you know, living in rural remote Kenya where people, um, are so hardworking and are now through Nuru being able to generate, um, a little bit of income, you know, the less you need, um, you know, the more you need to make, right. And the more you need to have. And so I think it's just an exercise of, um, beyond saying, Hey, I'm going to do this. I need this amount of runway what lifestyle changes are you going to make? You know, I didn't have a car for that first year either. I would borrow, um, you know, my fiance's car, I would take the bus, I would walk, um, and, you know, just to eliminate all these kind of excess costs, um, take your closet, make it really minimal. Know those clothes can last for a long time. Um, and just punker down on, on your expenses and, uh, and, and drive forward and make time for things that bring you pleasure, like, you know, a gym membership or, you know, maybe you like to have a beer or two on the weekend. Th those are great and we need those. Um, but I think runway wise, you know, it, it would depend, but I would just say be prepared to make it a, an entire lifestyle change to, to get to that next level and don't be afraid to be broke. I, man, I think that's such spot on advice. And I think that so much of our experience is driven by our expectations. And so I think if someone goes in with their eyes open of the expectation that, it, hey, it may be a year or two until I can pay myself and it could end in failure. And I'm going to just get every ounce of learning out of this as possible and just give this my all. I think that like, that's a better, better approach than I, I see a lot of people who enter this expecting from day one or maybe a month to, to be able to pay themselves. And that's just putting a lot of pressure pressure on this new baby organization to not only, you know, feed your creativity, but also feed your bank account. That's, that's a significant amount of stress for like a very early stage company. Yeah, that's right. And that was one of my mistakes in my first company was the first thing that happened was everyone got a really nice uh, paycheck and the overhead was really, really big. And we were well ahead of, you know, having any customers in sight before we got there. So yeah, watch that, uh, watch, watch that overhead from salary. Mm. Um, you know, you've you've mentioned a couple times failure and mistakes, and I, and you know, I personally believe that that's where all the juice in our, especially for startups, comes from is from the failures and the scars, and that's where we really learn and grow. And I'm wondering, with AC Global Risk, what has been one of the worst moments or biggest failures in your time so far, and and what you learned from that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the worst moments was at that was at a key time when. I knew how amazing the technology was, how the, the product and the solutions that we, that we had could be. And I not only believed in it so much, I saw it in action. It was, it was, it was really in, uh, incredible. But we were 
is still in the process of, you know, raising capital, figuring out how that was going to work. And there was a there was a time in uh, in January a couple years ago when I basically said, I think this is the the dead the drop dead date. I, I don't think the team can sustain this anymore because there is an end to it. You know, there is a time when you say, look, people just can't can't make it anymore. Um, and the business, you know, being undercapitalized as a business is a, is a death sentence. And so it was kind of this moment of, man, this could be great, um, but I'm going to miss out on it because we, you know, we need to get, we need an infusion, infusion of capital. And it was just, just that one moment, you know, I think we were, I was very confident the way things were going in terms of how everything was come together, but it was just this time when it, everyone just had to look around and get realistic around what if not. And I think that was you know, when you start seeing that, you start to think, okay, um, we can't, basically, we can't let this fail. Um, the create, the inventors, um, life work and the, and basically the incredible, uh, moral imperative to get this thing into the field to start saving lives. Just the thought of that was, was, um, was pretty tough, pretty depressing. <laughs> no, I totally relate with that. And you know, for me, the first of probably a thousand times that my company story box almost went under that very first time, it was like going to the edge of a cliff and looking down and realizing I, I'm about to go over this thing. And it was so hard, especially, uh, you know, not just for caring about the team and their safety and their well being, but just realizing how much of my own personal identity was wrapped around the success of this company and how it was like, it was literally impossible to think of failure for a very long time. But I found that that first time experiencing that this might go under in, in many ways was liberating because like you look down that cliff and you finally come to grips with it and you think, you know, this is not the end of the world. This is not the end of everything. And, it, and in, in a lot of ways, it gave me more freedom and more um, courage to kind of approach and really go after it in the future because I wasn't constantly worried of of dying <laughs> or having the company die. Yeah. And, and, you know, I imagine one thing I really admire in your background, and you've spoken to this, but with Nuru, I mean, you, you have been in just crazy environments where people have so much less. And I imagine you see still so much fulfillment in their life. And I imagine that instills in you a, a tremendous amount of gratitude and appreciation that um, makes it easier to kind of confront failure on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're feeling. I think that's a good way to think about it, too. The um, Once you get comfortable with that, with, with the worst, um, it does, and, and does embolden you a bit. That, um, that's great. I mean, the, uh, the, you know, you read a little philosophy in college and you start revisiting it later because there's some, there's a lot of truth in, in, uh, a lot that was written in, in some of those great works. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so, and, and absolutely. I mean, I think it's, I think courage is probably one of the, I think that's Peter Thiel's, you know, number one principle that he looks for in, in entrepreneurs. And I think, Courage is best when you're in a small team of people because you can't be courageous all the time and it's okay to have fear. But I think in a, in a small group of people who have that shared passion and desired end state and want to enjoy the, the, the fight and the, along the way. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it helps to have, to not be alone too, which is challenging. How, how, um, how big is the team that you work with as well? Like, what is that dynamic like? Yeah, it's great. We, you know, it's really, it's really cool because we have you know, kind of our engineer side, um, there are about four, five engineers and then we have our kind of our front end side and those are the military guys. So we've got this really cool culture of like engineers, but also military guys. And it's, it's awesome because, you know, at the end of the day you have really smart people and but people are really smart at different things. And, but there's a, there's a very nice harmony on the social IQ level, you know, on the shared passion for what we're trying to do. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're small, um, uh, but we're also, and we're different, um, but I think complement each other nicely. Like, you know, the engineers know that some of the, you know, the guys on the, on the op operation side, um, without them, they wouldn't be able to deliver, um, the solution to some of the locations we go to and vice versa. If we didn't have the engineers, we wouldn't have anything valuable to deliver other than showing up with, uh, <laughs> so it's a really nice, I think when you, when you love the other person and respect the other person on that other side of the job, you know, kind of more. Uh, and that's where we're trying to work for is this kind of, you know, needing the other person and showing respect in, uh, for them. It, it hope that hope that hopefully that harmony can keep as we scale and get bigger with our staff. And, and what advice do you have for veterans thinking of starting their own company? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say get in there if you if you have the bug. Um, you know, start with maybe doing some exploration around. Um, you know, some of the programs like Ignite. There's a lot of great um, other programs in there like Bunker Labs, which are kind of incubators for vets. They're all over the country. They're phenomenal. Um, I, I would just say start exploring and then you know have some conversations with your with your family and whether you're married or not or it's just you, um, and just with the realities of of entrepreneurship as you perceive them. But then do some interviews of people who are. Uh, you know, doing it real, real world. And this, I think this program does a great deal to help with that as well. But, you know, do some interviews and ask people who are doing it, you know, another a vet will always give another vet. Um, and to a large extent, most people will always give you 10 minutes or 15 minutes for a couple of questions. And then, you know, and then from there, just continue to explore it. But, you know, at the end of the day, if there's an idea um, uh, that you have uh, and, and there's a, a need, um, then, yeah, you know, get out there and, and start the you know, start the networking process, start the socializing it and uh, start exploring it. Jump in. That's awesome. Um, are there any resources, uh, books or specific podcast programs, websites, in addition to you, you mentioned Bunker Lab, Stanford Ignite, but anything else you would recommend to a veteran interested in starting a company? Yeah, you know, so I'm I'm getting into the podcast thing now, you know, with a lot of the travel, so I like that. Um, but more on the book side, because of kind of where I started, you know, uh, I, I'd recommend Stanley McChrystal's Team of Teams, just from a leadership perspective, just how it helps synthesize um, how small teams work kind of effectively and optimizes processes, and he tells it in a really um, interesting way. It's a compelling narrative. Um, that book is really, really good. Um, also, uh, hard, the hard thing about hard things by Ben Horowitz, a collection of his blogs, super fun to read, you know, you can just read them a couple at a time, um, and really inspiring too to read about his, his message and his plight. And then on the more kind of technical side, um, there's a book called get backed, um, which is by Evan bear, which is phenomenal. It basically gives you kind of the top, I don't know, 15 or 20, um, in the pitch decks. And, you know, this is the kind of book that you can just take literally and just pick and choose what you like and then build your own deck around that. Um, and so I th I'd say those are the, those are kind of the top three on the book side I would recommend to, to everyone. Now, once you get started, there's a book called the entrepreneur's guide to business law. If you buy this, you'll sell, save like thousands of dollars on legal. You just have to do some, uh, some reading and, uh, every answer you need is in this book. So I'd, I'd highly recommend it. it's expensive, but it's going to save you a lot in, in legal, which was another eye opener is how expensive, uh, uh, good legal counsel it is. That's awesome. And, and for listeners at beyondtheuniform.io, I'll add in the show notes links to all of those books. And I, I would also, I haven't read um, Team of Teams or Get Backed or the, the Business Law book, but Hard Thing About Hard Things, I did that as an audio book and loved it. I thought it was just so energizing. And yeah. uh, I yeah. had a lot of uh, respect and admiration for Ben Horowitz before that. But after reading it, you're like, I, I realize why this man was so successful. And I think he was very transparent in uh, what entrepreneurship is like, not, not sugarcoating it at all. Right. I think that's right. Um, any advice on, you had talked about kind of the fundraising process and any thoughts for veterans thinking of raising capital or, um, things that you've learned, uh, in, in your experience so far? Yeah, just the, the value of a great um, network and having a, a great mentor or two. Um, if you can identify someone in your space you know, who you look up to, who's, of, you know, great character and talent, um, and somehow weasel your way into, um, their ecosystem, even if it's 15 or 20 minutes a month or every quarter. Um, and you, you never want to tax, um, people's time too much. Uh, I made that mistake and you just become the annoying pestering, uh, groveling startup guy. Um, so, but you know, I think finding, identifying and finding a couple mentors, you know, listening from that, from, from them and, you know, learning from listening to them and learning from them is important. And then immersing yourself in, in a network. And I think those will help, um, connect you to capital. The capital is out there. Um, but you know, it, you, it's gotta be the right capital. You know, you gotta make sure that, um, the investors values are the same as yours, you know, that you're not just raising money for, for, for the money's sake, um, because the, the money's there. So use your kind of net work in the mentor group to align you with investors who you want to, you want to work with. It's in, you know, when you're starting a venture, it's like starting a family. It's a really intimate process. You know, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of, um, 
heart and soul that goes into it. Um, and there's a lot of passion, enthusiasm, you know, all these feelings. And so when you have your investor in there, you want to make sure that that's someone that, you know, will help you grow, help the company grow and won't be kind of a drag, um, to, to you know, to the force as the company gains momentum. So I think just the importance of getting a mentor and immersing yourself in a, in a powerful network, you'll be able to identify, you know, Oh, this, this angel group is here. This, these individuals here would love to take your meeting. Trust me, there's, there's people out there that are looking to place capital into great ideas and into good, uh, founders. Um, you just have to network your way to them. I think that's great. And I love that thought on, on mentors. And I, I think it is funny too, that you said, to. Um, you, you had mentioned kind of burning out people. I think that's so true. I've done that so often where I, you know, you just, it's, it's almost like there's blood in the water. You see, you have so much to do. You need so much help and you see someone, you know, ble- you know, good for them, like great people, like good hearts trying to help. And then you just try to suck everything out of them. And you kind of, I right, learned yes. that lesson the hard way too of like, man, I got to have a bunch of people I can go to for advice so I don't overbear and try and keep, you know, for me, it's kind of like once, especially for the people who are really, really um, impressive backgrounds, you know, maybe once a quarter reaching out and being really specific in what I need rather than, you know, once a week, what crisis I need help with. That, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I think you, I think you interviewed Don Fall a little bit ago. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. um, I haven't released that one yet, but we just spoke and it's, it's coming out pretty soon. And man, that guy is, I mean, you and like probably everyone else has recommended him to me. It's a uh, pretty just great wealth of experience and he has seemed effective at just really giving back to the community. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. He's, I mean, he, and he and, and his wife, Katie are, you know, supporters of a lot of great things and they're really, you know, active and, and just supportive. Um, and you know, but as an example, just the, the email that I sent earlier this morning, you know, was a, a request for, you know, 10 minutes. And I know that his time is so at a premium. Um, and then here's the boom, the three quick questions I wanted his, his feedback on. And you know, I mean that I've had to learn because the initial calls with, with him and other people who, who are like him, uh, like Jake, you know, at Nuru and other people who are down at Stanford in the network would be, Hey, do you have, you know, 45 minutes or an hour to basically discuss everything? And it's, and, and they do it, but it's just now looking back, I'm like cringe. I'm like, Oh, it was so annoying. Um, I probably still am. And, uh, you know, when Don hears this, he can be like, yeah, you're still in it. But, um, you know, you just, you crave their, a little bit of their, you know, experience and their insight and, and, um, it can mean a lot to get these little, little, but like you said, if you just have that specific ask, specific question, it can be those gems that really help you as you're, as you're doing your problem solving. Yeah. And I love what you said too, about where you, where you said these are the three questions. And I, I, that's a habit I try to get into as well is like, before I even reach out, I make a list of the questions. So I know right away, I think including them in emails great. Cause I think a lot of these people that, you know, they're going to be jotting off very, very effective, powerful responses. And he's probably typing it in, in the bathroom while he's going to the bathroom break. You know, it's like literally like sure, catching sure. them when they have time <laughs> and, and also not being offended. Like I, I, I've had so many people and, and I, I try to do this now as well, but it's like, you know, they just being humble enough to let them fit you in wherever will make sense. That could be driving home after work. That could be very early in the morning when they're going somewhere, but recognizing their time's valuable and letting them know that. So you're okay, you know, just getting the response by email or you're okay getting the, you know, the scraps of their time in some ways, but the scraps of these people's time, if they're really high value, it's still worth it. And, and, you know, like you said, 45 minutes to an hour, that's, that's probably difficult for their children to get at times, you know? And so they <laughs> want, right. they want to help you, but you know, 10 minutes of, of someone like Don's time is, is, you know, that's going to save you hundreds of hours. And so recognizing right. that and not being offended if they turn you away, that's why, you know, just creating that habit of asking because, you know, for every one per 10 people you ask, one people, one person will say yes. And that could be the difference for you. That's great. I think you just, yeah, that's, Perfect. Is there, um, is there any habit, you know, I, I think that the military instills so many great habits that have helped me succeed and I know have helped you succeed. I'm, I'm curious though, are there any habits you felt like you needed to actively break or habits that you had to choose to let go of in order to be successful on the civilian side? Yeah, you know, that's a great, it's a great question. I, I think on the, you know, on the habits that I have to, you have to maintain and you have to work at are things like, you know, waking up early, you know, getting great workouts in, you know, those are things that you just have to keep doing and the military did a great job doing it. On the, on the break side, I think falling in love with the deployment cycle, you know, hey, I've got 18 and, and even though I would argue, 
that at the tactical level, whether you're driving a ship or you're flying an, uh, an aircraft or fighting an infantry platoon, um, that's when, you know, there's no, there's no d distinct schedule. It's very, you have to be very creative, you know, that's where we kind of shine. Yeah. But in terms of knowing, Hey, I'm only here for seven months or seven days. And then I've got an 18 month workup and you kind of know how your life's going to play out over the next, uh, fr frankly, a couple of years. That is, was very comforting um, from a planning perspective. You say, okay, I know exactly where I'm going to be for this 18-month workup um, or this two-year workup before deployment. Um, and then kind of having to go into the mindset of, you know, now in, in this world, you have to be super uh, flexible and adapt to, you know, on the scheduling-wise and the planning-wise and the market speaking to you and the customers are asking for different things. And, you know, the second – um, you know, you publish the business plan, which, you know, I'm still a big believer in, in business plans with DEX and the financial model, all this stuff, you know, you burn it because you, it's changed, right? And you have the core principles. And so I think it's just knowing, um, whereas in the military, you had this, you know, this plan of, of how to work up to hit the quote market to deploy. The same is not true of, of the business world. I mean, you just, you know, it, it, but you still at least need to go through the motions, I think, of, 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 of planning, have a work plan, having a task, having, you know, those objectives. But um, breaking the habit of needing to, of not hitting those as being a bad thing necessarily because things change. And I think that's the biggest, has been the biggest thing for me and kind of our organization. That's great. And um, I'm wondering just, you know, you talked about specifically at AC Global Risk, but I'm just wondering um, if there's any other mistake you made since you've gotten out um, of the Marines on, on active duty on the Marines, any mistake you've made or failure you've experienced that you really learned from and you'd want to share with listeners? Yeah. I mean, tons of, tons of failures and mistakes. <laughs> I mean, it's just like the, the, uh, littered, the, the walls are littered with those for, for me here. But I mean, I mean, I guess in particular, you know, there's a, there's a, a sense of timing and of hitting certain objectives that you think are going to then make everything, ah, oh, now I'll enjoy myself. And, you know, I think early on it was, okay, we're back. Now let's, you know, take it from test to get some trial customers. And then let's build the case out. Then we'll feel good. Then let's raise some capital. Then we'll feel good. Then we'll get more customers. And then we'll feel good. And the, the problem with that is, is that in between those, those milestones is, is life, right? Is like the daily life. It's like waking up. It's like playing with your dog. It's, and even though we were obsessed with this and we're working all the time, you still there's still room for life in there. So I think, um, you know, because I, this is truly what I, I would want to do nothing else other than than this. And because I know everyone on our team feels the same way, um, we have to enjoy the fact that we're actually have the opportunity to do this. And so, you know, stopping and, you know, interjecting uh, jokes into meetings and, you know, adding some element of being lighthearted and humor um, because, you know, it can be very stressful and you can be working to that next objective when you think, well, then I'll be feel better and then I can enjoy it. The mistake, I think, for the first year was not enjoying every every uh, hour today uh, as you went, because that's that's the story that hopefully whether you fail or succeed, you'll be able to tell. And it's kind of your story to write. And it I think stories are good when they have a little bit of humor and, you know, a little bit of adventure in there. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to work on now. Yeah, that's so powerful, man. I think that's so applicable in personal life. And, and I know I, that definitely resonates with me in startups as well, which is like, I, I have always been looking at like, oh, when this happens, things will be easier. And it never, it's never true, you know? And I think right. that's, it's never true because we are driven people that are always reaching for more. And so when you reach that next level, you want to go to the next. And so you're never really satisfied, which I think is a great asset. But I, I love the way you said that. And that's, you know, definitely one of my goals in life right now is to try and just really be present wherever I'm at and be, you know, not thinking about the next eight things I'm going to do, but just try to enjoy each moment. I think that's just a, a beautiful way to live and definitely not easy, but I think um, worth, worth the effort of trying to build that muscle. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, well, I know we're short on time here, so the last question I always ask, like to ask is just what else would you want listeners to know, knowing that you have this group of great veterans and active duty members listening? Um, what final words of wisdom would you like to leave them with? Yeah, you know, I think we, we all are kind of touched by the, by the service bug. You know, we, we, we had a call to serve. That doesn't stop when we took off the uniform, and I, and I think sometimes it's hard to find ways to scratch, to scratch that itch. Um, and everyone has different life circumstances and needs. Um, but I think there's, there's time 
uh, or an, a need to carve out time to, to scratch that service itch. So, you know, I think for all of us as kind of a community um, or, you know, within this ecosystem of the veteran entrepreneur or veteran, uh, you know, businessman or woman, I think it's really important to to kind of align in some way, some aspect of our life with continuing to serve, you know, whether it's working, you know, on things that are really causes really big, like, you know, we're volunteering with Team Rubicon or, you know, doing working at, at a at an inner city school and donating your time as a, as an, as a you know, tutor or, or really just small things like, you know, helping out someone in your apartment, you know, who needs extra help at just an hour a week or something. I think just finding ways to invest um, time to serve is something I think we we thrive on and we need, and I think I think we're 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 uniquely qualified to to help. So I think if we can, you know, all do a little something, I think it'll do a lot of good, and I also think it'll do um, a lot of good for us as we you know transition from one very structured method of service to 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 another less structured but also really important method of service. So I guess I guess that's my call to action. You know, do something. I love it. Well, Alex, I appreciate your sharing your advice and your experience and, and everything you've learned with the Beyond the Uniform community. And I wish you safe travels in Ecuador back to San Francisco and look forward to seeing the continued success of your team and the, the AC Global Risk team. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for what you're doing here. It's really important. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Thanks for listening. As we wrap up, I wanted to share three quick but important announcements. First of all, if you haven't already, please sign up for my newsletter at beyondtheuniform.io. Although I publish on LinkedIn and Facebook, I'll be starting to use the newsletter as my primary means to share new articles, episodes, and resources relevant to the veteran community. Second, I would love to hear from you. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a relationship where I do all of the talking. You can view me as your very own dedicated resource to help you and other veterans in your civilian career. Have feedback on what I can do differently? Let me know. Someone in particular you want me to track down for an interview? I'm all ears. Know of another way that I could help the veteran community? I'm dying to know. You can find me on LinkedIn, comment on any post at beyondtheuniform.io, email me at justin at beyondtheuniform.io, or if you're in the intel industry, I'm sure you can track me down in some super creepy way. However you do it, take me up on it. I thrive on feedback. Lastly, a quick plug for a few resources I think would benefit any veteran. American Corporate Partners and Service to School both provide free assistance to any veteran. American Corporate Partners pairs you with a mentor in your desired industry, and Service to Schools finds a mentor at a suitable undergrad or graduate school program to help you with your application. Check them out. As always, tons of great content and resources available at beyondtheuniform.io. I'm Justin Nasiri, and I'll be back soon with more great episodes.